Cindy. Just give it a moment for people to drop in. Okay. Can they get in now? Oh, so we might just get started. So uh, I think maybe we're going to wait for another one minute. Is it? Yeah, okay? sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think, yeah, yeah, everything, everyone's get ready. Yeah, if other people, they can arrive, you know, they can get to join, join us later. Okay, sure. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, so, Nin Hao, No Mai, Haere Mai, and welcome to the Faculty of Education and Social Works Information Evening uh, for members of the Chinese Association of Early Childhood Teachers. My name is Sophie Scott Elvidge. I am the postgraduate taught recruitment specialist here at the faculty. Um, and I'll be your host for this evening. I am joined tonight by Joshua Sarpon, who is our subdoctoral and doctoral advisor here at the faculty, and also by Camille Yang, who is the, uh, one of the founders of the Chinese Association of Early Childhood Teachers and also a current master's student. Um, so who better to have? Um, I'll just run through some brief housekeeping first. Um, so firstly, just uh, apologies if I'm coughing at all, just getting over the tail end of an illness. Um, we do have a Q&A function. So as we go through the presentation this evening, if you do have any questions that you wanna ask, um, just feel free to pop them into the Q&A box. Please try and use the Q&A function rather than the chat function. Um, that'll just enable us to go through those questions at the end. And we do have quite a generous time as well to go through those questions. Um, so tonight we're mainly just going to go through the education programs that are on offer at the faculty, the master's programs. Um, first, we'll just start with why choose the Faculty of Education and Social Work at the University of Auckland. We are New Zealand's top ranked university. Um, we're also the number one university for education as a subject. We have a 97% employment rate for the faculty graduates, which is pretty impressive. Um, as well as very strong connections in both schools and communities across Northland and Auckland. Um, you're also going to experience teaching from world-class researchers and experienced practitioners on this program. Um, pretty much all of our lecturers have been practitioners out in the field. They have been, if they're teaching early childhood, early childhood educators. Um, so they do have the benefit of practical experience as well as that world-class research to back it up. The programs are relevant, they're focused, they're customized um, within the best of our ability. If we can make the program fit you, fit your life, fit your needs, uh, fit your practice, then we will. 
Um, you also want to be thinking about your results. You want somewhere that's going to give you good career development, improved practice, because that's probably why you're thinking about these programs, um, insights into that world-class theory and research, and you're also going to be connected with a community of scholars. Um, you also want to make sure that you're maximizing your cost, and that's not just financial, but that's also your time, your social life, and your effort and hard work. So we have a range of master's programs on offer, um, and a lot of them have very similar names, which can make it a little bit confusing when you're first looking at them. Some of them, as you can see, are 120 points. Some of them are 180 points. Um, a lot of the difference between whether you do 120 or 180 point will depend on your prior qualifications and the entry criteria to that program. Um, at least one of our programs as well also has a taught or a research option, but some of our programs are either taught or research. So we'll go through what that means in just a moment. Um, essentially, taught courses means that you're going to be going through a series of courses where you're enrolling with a bunch of other students. You may be doing collaborative work or you may be doing individual assignments, but you'll be taught alongside a cohort, a class of other people. Um, it's really great if you want to learn about several topics and if you prefer to work or discuss things together in a class situation in a cohort format. Research is really great if you want to learn more about one particular topic. So particularly if you have a particular um, issue or insight into your own practice that you want to do a bit more of a deep dive into, um, that's where research is really great. You can understand more about that particular topic. And also if you've noticed gaps in research when you've been looking into something in your own practice um, or in the field generally, that's where you can contribute to a body of knowledge for other teachers as well. It's also quite important to choose a research program if you see yourself studying towards a doctoral degree in the future. And I know for some people that can sound quite scary at, at this point, um, but it may always be something that you get inspired to think about as you go through the studying journey. So we'll start with our sort of cornerstone master's program, which is the Master of Education. This is a 180 point program. Um, and that means that it will either generally either take you 1.5 years if you're studying full time or three years if you're studying part time. Um, if you are working alongside studying, we always recommend that you study part time. This is quite a wide master's in terms of you can there's a lot that you can choose from. So there are two elective courses and they can be any courses you want. Um, you could either even pick courses from outside of the faculty. If they're going to make sense for your intended research, for your practice, then we want to design a program that's going to make sense for you. After your two elective courses, you then do a research methods course. And this course is really important for scaffolding you into that uh, 90 point thesis. Um, in your research methods course, that's where you will kind of learn about different research methods, uh, how to write a literature review, how to write a research project, all of that really, really important stuff um, that you'll need for when you start your thesis. Your 90 point thesis then is basically half of the program. Um, and that could either be done normally over a year if you're full time or one and a half years if you're part time. Um, and that really is your opportunity to do that sort of deep dive into an area that you're really interested in or that you've noticed has gaps in its research. The entry for this program is a GPA of five in your prior education. Um, and you will need some idea of what you're planning to focus your research on. At the point where you're going in and doing your first talk course, you don't need a really, really solid fleshed out idea and research question. You just need an idea of, this is something I'd really like to look into. Next is the Master of Educational Leadership, and this has a research and a taught option. So the research option consists of one core course, which is the Educational Leadership course, 
and then a core elective. And what we mean by that is it's from a small pool of electives that you can choose. Um, you then do a research methods course, which again will bridge you into doing that 90 point thesis. The entry requirement is quite similar to the Master of Education. You will need a GPA of five, um, some idea of what you're planning to focus your research on. And this master's program is really for those who are wanting to go into leadership or who may already be in leadership positions. So now we come to the taught version of the Master of Educational Leadership. Um, again, the purpose is the same. It's for those who may already be in leadership positions in their schools, or they may be wanting to move into leadership positions. Um, the taught version, you will go through six courses. Um, you can do those fully online if you wish. And if you do choose the fully online version, you can complete that within two years. Um, the Master of Professional Studies in Education is a 120 point program. This is a really interesting program um, because it's got a 60 point dissertation, which a lot of our programs don't. Um, what this program consists of is two elective courses, which again, can be anything you want. Uh, you will then do your research methods course, which will then teach you how to do your 60 point dissertation. Um, it is important to note with this course that although it's classed as a taught program, um, it does still lead to doctoral studies because it's got that 60 point dissertation. The Master of Education Practice now is a 180 point program, um, which again, either one and a half years full time or three years part-time. Um, it's got a one core course, which is an education practice course. It's then got a core elective, um, and then it's got four elective courses. Sorry, that last one should say elective course. For this program, you'll need a GPA of 3.5 in your prior qualification. Um, it is important to note with this program that it doesn't have a research component, which means that there is no direct pathway to doctoral studies. There, there are always options if you do do a taught program and then you decide you want to do doctoral studies, um, but it is going to take you a little bit longer. So it's better to just think about it at the point of starting your master's. Uh, we've then got the 120 point master of education practice, which uh, again, it very much depends on what your prior study is. Uh, whether you would do the 120 point or the 180 point program. Um, it generally requires something like a graduate diploma in teaching for entry into it, as well as a GPA of five. This is a shorter program. So you would do that first core course, which is an education practice course, one core elective, and then two further elective courses. If you are thinking about one of these programs and you think that your GPA may be less than five or you're not sure, don't fret. Um, most people in their undergraduate degrees, me included, were not really thinking about our GPA. We were just thinking about getting through the degree. Um, and so we completely understand and we're not going to block you out of postgraduate study. All that happens if you don't quite have the GPA is that you start out in what's called a postgraduate certificate in education. Um, this is a 60 point program, which is normally two courses. And you just need to get a B average across those two courses. And then we transfer them into the master's program that you want to do. So as long as you get that B average in those two courses, we delete the postgraduate certificate, move the courses into the master's program, and you just continue in that program. So it's no further time no further study. Um, it's just that you do the first two courses under that postgrad certificate. There are a lot of courses uh, that focus on early childhood. There are also a lot of courses that focus on um, quite a wide range of, of different areas and for programs like the Master of Education, the Master of Education Practice, um, you can include courses that come from our social work department, counselling, 
professional supervision, um, whatever makes sense for you. So some of those courses are early childhood curriculum issues. Um, one of the really popular courses that we have on offer is always educational psychology. Um, and then we've also got some, some quite wide range of courses such as education and diversity, uh, issues in child welfare and protection and those domestic violence challenge and protection papers. You can Zoom into class from anywhere in real time, um, especially with COVID, we've all had to learn to be in a much more flexible sort of world. Um, and with that, a lot of our courses are now either offered online or as hybrid courses. So for the online courses, what that will mean is they will either have scheduled class times uh, that you can Zoom into online, or they may not have scheduled class times, they may have recorded lectures, and for some of those hybrid courses, they may have some face-to-face -face lectures and some online lectures. Um, and there may always be the option if you can't attend face-to-face -to, -face, to attend online with the rest of the class. So I'd now like to introduce Camille Yang, who's one of the founders of the Chinese Association of Early Childhood Teachers uh, and a current master's student with us. Um, she also plans to continue through to PhD study. So if any of you are thinking about that, She's the girl to listen to. Um, so I'll just let her introduce herself and just answer a few of the questions on the screen now. Okay, thank you, Sophie. Thank you for your, you know, your, for your effort and your time to give us, you know, the details of all the programs. So my name is Camille and uh, like everyone, you know, originally I'm from China. I came here, you know, more than, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah, I have been in ECE field more than 10 years. So I'm one of the founders of CAECE. -E. I think everyone knows, you know, CAECE -E is Chinese Association about, you know, of ECE. -E. So we have, we have around 1,500 members. They are all Chinese and in the ECE -E field. Some of them are, you know, New Zealand registered teachers. Some of them are still in training some of them are managers and some of them are investors in ECE and some of them are Chinese and New Zealand early childhood education communication experts so mm, thank you everyone for joining us so what make me to choose this program? So like everyone, I start my ECE career, you know, uh, start with level five in early childhood education and then level six, level seven, you know, go through this. Uh, after I have been, you know, been a ECE teacher for so many, so many years, at the beginning I was, you know, volunteer reliever, you know, part-time teacher, qualified teacher, you know, later I moved to management, you know, management. Um, after so many years in the ECE field, I was quite stuck, I was quite confused as well because of lots of things happening you know every day you know just you know doing the same work and also the salary is also considerable salary you know i just feel like you know i made lots of efforts you know uh when i try to when i try to buy a house i, I found it put it was quite difficult to pay the mortgage because you know you know, I, I just feel like, you know, I didn't have enough money, you know, every week to pay the mortgage and everything. And I was thinking, you know, I'm, or I was already in the management, you know, field. I was thinking, you know, and uh, one thing is about my career, which we I should go because I have been in that field for, you know, 10 years. I feel like which way I should go, you know, to to in extend my knowledge and also something new because I like you know challenges. I want something new. I also want to extend my knowledge because I want I really interested in ECE. I don't want to jump to other fields. And also I want to <laughs> I want <laughs> feel like my salary if it could be more that can be better. So I had a look at all the you know universities in in Auckland and uh, had a look at all the programs you know later and then I chose master of professional practice and uh, for the uni I chose Auckland University I think you know because it's the best university in Auckland yeah. After I studied at University of Auckland, you know, 
I was quite impressed because when, you know, at that time I didn't know because you, you guys can see there's lots, lots of programs over there. I didn't know which program I should choose, you know, you know, I was so confused. So I went to the office and then that's a lady, you know, she, I think she was in Sophie's role. Yeah. And she helped me a lot. She have helped me went through all of the program and you know, only with me one by one. And she said, what kind of, you know, what document do you have or what kind of, you know, practice all of, you know, all of this, she helped me one by one until I get the offer and then paid everything. And uh, once I start my, you know, I started my study. She was still helping me, you know, how to choose the course and then what should I do? Lots of things. I, you know, she was so helpful. So I, I found, you know, you know, from admin part, it was very helpful. And from lecture part, because you know, I was working full time and part time study, you know, it's it's gonna be gonna be quite hard. And plus, I have you know, I have uh, my son with me. So the tutor, the, the, the lecture, they are very helpful as well. They help me if, if I have any problems, they just email, I email them and they email me back very quickly and then make an appointment with them. So they went through everything with me. I found it's quite helpful as well. For my practice, I feel like, you know, before, you know, it's I always practice in ECE later, you know, in the ECE field, you know, have lots of experience, but I don't have much experience about research. So after I started, you know, Master of Education, I feel like, you know, it's something new. It is, diff it, I mean, I can't see difficult. It is not easy. And um, it is not easy, but it's something, you know, with the supervisor, su supervisor, with the help of your supervisor, you can achieve. So I found, you know, research, I really, you know, interesting in research and that it opens a new field, opens a new door for me. I found, oh, it's, and my, super, my supervisor is very helpful as well. I have two supervisors, you know, they help me a lot. It's kind of like, you know, you walk into, you walk into University of Auckland, I mean, education, education departure, the campus of Epsom, but I don't know the other departure, you know. You walk into the campus and then you need help, you know, from the first step and they, ha they help me from enrollment and now which program I enroll from my study, you know, the, the lecture, they were so helpful. My lecture, they are very, very nice. Helpful, you know, about my research, my study and everything. And it helped me about my practice as well, you know, make me think of why, you know, I practice like this, you know, what makes sense. And also open a new field about, about my, my study and my career as well. So now I'm really interested in, you know, in research, you know, academic part. So, and uh, so I'm going to, you know, in start my doctoral, doc doctoral study as well. I supposed to be start my last year, but you know, I have been very busy and lazy. <laughs> so I'm still working on, on my master, you know, I got my assignment, my thesis will do very soon. So I can submit, hopefully I can start my doctoral study very soon as well. And for this study also open the new door for my career as well. You know, after I'm, after I had been a ECE teacher in the daycare and also jump into the management role. And after that, I went, I went to tertiary you know, education because I have my registration and because I have so many years practice in uh, ECE field. So I started my tertiary teachings. I started from level five. Level five uh, is diploma in early childhood education. Yeah. And I found it's quite it's quite interesting. It's a little bit challenge, but not that much. I think you know, with the study and with the experience, experience practice experience, and also with the knowledge, I think you know, I can handle it. It's it's, it's good. And because I want to 
study, you know, doc continuum doctoral study. So now I changed my job. I, I changed my job to be, you know, it's also tertiary level, but it's teaching level four certificate in early childhood education. Yeah, I found it's quite useful. Why, you know, after I found, you know, the Master of Education helped me and the University of Auckland helped me and it's so helpful. So that's why I talk with the founders of our organization, you know, CAECE. -E. I said, why don't we ask them to help us because help the group of our people. So it's, this workshop has been run, I think almost two years. So every workshop, it was very successful. So um, it's give you some ideas. And before we run it, you know, face to face, face you know since COVID-19 so we run you know face to face yeah I think if you guys have any problems you know any issues or any question or something later on uh, you you can you know go to the University of Auckland go to Sophie you know and also if you want to talk with me that's okay yeah thank you very much that's all I want to say yeah I just give the time to Sophie yeah Oh, thank you for that. That was really helpful. Okay. Okay, I will, um, I, I just want to give a quick reminder that if you do have any questions, please do use the question box down below um, and we'll just go through those at the end. Um, but I'll now hand over to Joshua to go through some doctoral studies. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so my name is Joshua Sapon and um, I came to New Zealand as an international student. Um, I did my bachelor's degree in Ghana, my um, home country, and then my master's degree in Norway, and finally came to New Zealand for my PhD. And so like Hamil, I'm also um, a past student of this great university and this faculty. Um, to add to what Sophie said, you know, we are ranked among the top 30 faculty of education in the world. So, um, it was a privilege to study in the great faculty. Yes, you've heard a lot about um, the master's degree program. And I know some of you at this stage will be thinking about, you know, going on to do a PhD like Camille. So I'm here to kind of tell you what the program entails. So from those, um, both theoretical aspect and also practical because I've gone through it and um, I'll be sharing some experiences with you. So yes, the PhD, um, I know sometimes students get confused when they are applying. We have two types of doctoral studies. That is PhD, Doctor of Philosophy, and the Doctor of Education. So I'll explain the difference between these two. The Doctor of Philosophy is purely, um, it's purely research based. And so um, as a full time, you do it for three years. And part time is normally six years minimum and then eight years maximum. For the full time, it is three years minimum, four years maximum. But for international students, um, we are not allowed or encouraged to do it on part-time because of our visa issues. And so that is why here you see three years full time. And at the end of your PhD, you come up with a doctoral thesis. That is what is expected of you. There is no coursework in your PhD. But like the master's degree, you know, sometimes during your, um, you know, admission process, your potential supervisor would advise that maybe because you don't have a strong research background, they would encourage that you do a research method course as part of your PhD. And so that is when probably you'll be allowed to do research. Apart from that, the PhD is purely research and there is no coursework. And with a doctor of education, that is kind of um, for those who are, um, you know, working and want to study. And so the first two years is normally um, taught courses. And then the last two years um, is purely research. And so, you know, it is done on cohort basis. Um, unlike the PhD where, you know, you can apply at any time during the year. For the doctor of education that is done at a different um, time of the year. So I'll explain this as we go. So um, we'll move on to my next slide. And okay, great. 
So I'm going to start with a PhD. So now you'll be asking yourself, what do you need to be able to enter the PhD program? So when you apply, the admissions team will assess your um, transcript. You know, they will convert it to the University of Auckland um, grading system to see if you meet the GPA requirement of 6.0. And another thing is also that you need to have a Bachelor of Honours degree with first class, but um, you know, you know, it must you know be compared to that of the University of Auckland. And so the admissions team will do that analysis to see whether your qualification is similar to what we have here at the University of Auckland. And another thing is also you need to have a master's degree. So you could have the Bachelor of Honours first class, or you could have the second class division, or you can have master's degree. And I think um, you'll be asking yourself, how do I know if um, mine is similar to that of University of Auckland? So I think it was hard for me as well, but um, it is always good to ask um, the admissions team and they are happy to respond to you. And another thing you need to do is to choose your research interest and find a supervisor. I think this is a very interesting or very key thing that I would advise that you do, because um, there are times that um, you have a strong GPA, for example, you can have a GPA of 8.0, but then if you don't get a supervisor, it will be very hard to get an admission. So at the initial stages, we advise that um, applicants normally look for supervisor. So when you go to our university or the faculties page, you'll find um, um, a link that says find supervisor. So you have a list of supervisors with their research interests. So it is encouraged that you go through the list and then choose someone you think your research interest aligns with, and then you can contact the person. So usually before you contact your potential supervisor, you have a research um, interest as in statement of research intent, what you want to do. Then you write to the professor and say, Dear Professor, so so and so, I am this, and I'm interested in working with you. This is what I want to explore. And so you establish that rapport at the initial stages. And if they are happy to supervise you, then they would encourage you to go ahead and apply. I know sometimes it can be challenging because with myself, for example, I couldn't find a supervisor at the initial stage. So I would say that shouldn't stop you from applying. Just put in your application. When it comes in, um, you know, it's my duty. So we will help to find you a supervisor. So you will separate your research interest among academics in the faculty. And if anyone is interested, they will come up and then we will process your application. So that is very important. So the next thing is, yes, everything is done. You submit your online application. So in submitting your online application, um, you know, you'll be asked to upload certain documents. And one key thing is your academic transcript. You know, that is when you get to know your GPA and the statement of research intent that I spoke about. You know, we sometimes call it preliminary proposal. And another thing is also to arrange for your doctoral reviews, people who can attest to the fact that, yes, you have a strong research background and you can do a PhD. Yes, because I mean, not everyone can do that, you know, so um, someone should be able to testify that, okay, you are a strong candidate for the PhD program. And another key thing that we also look at is your um, thesis and your publication history, you know, you it's not compulsory to have you know publications, but then we want to assess how strong is your thesis. Is it something that um, gives you a strong foundation for the PhD? Because one thing you realize is that the PhD journey is quite lonely, and it is purely independent. You know, unlike the masters where you meet your lecturers almost every day. For the PhD, sometimes in the whole year, it is encouraged that at least you meet your supervisor once in a month, but it is kind of independent. And so we need to have a strong research background. Yeah, so we like to see your academic CV to see that you are a strong fit for the PhD. So these are the kind of documents that we encourage, encourage applicants to upload.
as part of the admission requirements. Now, like um, the PhD, you know, the entry requirement for the doctor of education is also um, a GP of 6.0. And then you need a bachelor of honors, first class or second class. And then you need a master's degree. And again, here too, you need um, a research project or dissertation. Yes, it is important to, to have that. And because this is kind of for those who are working, you need at least two years professional experience in education. And so um, one interesting thing about the um, Doctor of Education is that here, you know, you're kind of combining theory with practice. So it, it, is, it is an interesting program that, um, you know, I encourage people to enroll in. And so, yes, and also you need to be based in New Zealand to undertake this program. So unlike the PhD where, you know, at this stage, you can be out, offshore and do it um, with a Doctor of Education, you need to be based here in New Zealand. And um, because of visa issues, this is not really recommended for um, you know, international students. And so um, you may be asking yourself, so can I enroll in this one? Um, at this point, um, the answer may be no, but um, if you are in New Zealand, you know, in the future, then um, this is you know, a program that you may want to enroll in. And yeah, so that is it. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, that was brilliant, Josh. Thank you. Um, so I've just got a slide here to go through how long, um, because especially at postgraduate level, the time limits are really important at the University of Auckland. Um, so it is really important just to bear in mind the time frame that you're planning to do uh, your master's in to make sure that you are within the time limits. Um, so these are just showing you some of those time frames there. When you do apply for a program, if you gain admission to that program, we will always send you details with um, what courses you need to enroll in and everything, and it will always state what the time limits are there. Um, I'll just note with those two down the, the two at the bottom, the two boxes there where it says four years and six years part-time, those are the maximum time limits that are allowed. Um, so normally with, you know, a 120 point program, you would be aiming to complete it in two years part-time because that would be one course each semester, um, which is a nice kind of part-time load alongside if you're working full-time. Um, but just to bear in mind that you know, the time limits are quite generous, 12 semesters um, for a 180 point taught program. So if you do need some extra time for those programs, that's absolutely fine. Um, and when you are in, you know, your research, we also understand that at postgrad level, particularly people have got work and lives and families and sometimes things happen that you can't always plan for. Um, so if something's happening and you do need time off at all in your research, just get in touch with us and there are processes that we can undergo in order to approve some time off for you. So if you have heard something that's inspired you tonight and you're thinking I want to go and apply, um, the easiest way to do so is always online. If you hop onto our website, there's a banner right up the top that says apply now. If you just click on that and go through the application steps, um, that's, that's the best way to apply. If you miss anything in the application, if you've applied for a program that isn't quite the right one, maybe you've applied for a 120 point and you need a 180 point, anything like that, we will generally get in touch with you and let you know. Um, so it is always an open conversation that you can have with us. We, we will try not to just ever say no. Um, if there are options, then we'll let you know what they are. Um, you can apply for semester two this year, or you could apply for semester one uh, next year. It's never too early, really, to apply for future semesters and start thinking about studying. We do have quite a lot of support available uh, at the Epsom campus while studying, which Camille's spoken to a little bit as well. Um, there is disability support, English language support, health and well-being services, counselling, 
uh, academic and libraries workshops. And I know as a mature student myself, I have definitely made use um, of some of that academic support in the libraries workshops. And if you are feeling nervous at all, if it's been a little while since you've gone back into study, um, I, I can't recommend those highly enough. It just kind of gave me the confidence that yes, actually I was gonna be fine going back into study and this was what I wanted to do. So um, we'll now just move into the question and answer portion and I can just see a couple um, of questions there. So just feel free to keep them coming as well throughout this because we've got quite a bit of time now to answer any questions that you might have. Um, I think, yeah, I think they have a two question. One is uh, Serena, another, another one is Queenie, I think. Quinty. Yes. Um, so Quentin has asked about the postgraduate certificate in professional supervision. Mm -hmm. um, for early childhood leadership, which is what, what you are asking about there, it wouldn't be the first program that I would recommend. Um, it, it tends to be more for people who are looking at moving into professional supervision as in maybe more in a counseling social work space or as well in a teaching space where you might be mentoring other teachers. Um, if you're looking at leadership specifically, I, I would probably look at the Master of Educational Leadership. And there's also um, a postgraduate diploma of educational leadership if you did want to look at that. But yeah, the Master of Educational Leadership is a really great one if you're looking at leadership. Um, if you are interested in professional supervision, we do have some postgraduate information evenings towards the end of uh, June. Cool. Um, so there's a question about doing the Master of Education practice fully online in the coming semester. Um, as, as far as I'm aware, that program, it can't be taken as a fully online program. However, um, a lot of the courses in that program now are available to take online. Um, Camille, maybe you'd like to add to that, whether you've taken courses online as part of that program. Okay, all right. Um, I'm not very sure about, you know, the coming semester, mm. but, you know, because all of the co courses, I think, is after hours. So, for example, it's at weekend, maybe Saturday. I remember some of them, one course is a Saturday and one is uh, it's every Monday, every mm. Monday after four o'clock or once at evening, I forgot. So that's, you know, for the, the courses arrangement. So it's quite, I think it's, they, I think they already consider it about, you know, the people they are working, you know, because of this, most of these are domestic students, you know, of course, you know, most of them are working. I remember the earliest one from my, from my experience, the earliest one is, I think it's from 4.30 to something, 4.30 to 6.30. And then it's only every Monday morning and it lasts for eight weeks. So if you are working full time, you know, you, you can still, you know, maybe ask for, if it's four o'clock, you know, ask for maybe for one hour leave or every Monday or something. And another one is at weekend, I remember. Yeah. So I think it's quite handy, yeah. Yeah, no, we definitely um, try to design the program for people who are working full time yeah. and, and definitely for the education programs. Most of the people studying them are teachers working full time in classrooms Monday to Friday and can't, you know, it's not like an undergraduate degree where yeah. you might be sort of in class uh, at random times during the day. Yeah, yeah, very different from undergraduate, you know, study. So I think don't need to worry about this too much you know and also if it's fully online you feel like you don't get enough support from the lectures and mm -hmm. also you can't interact with the student you know they are from because in the mass of education and most of the students they are i mean all of them from ECE before from education field but not only ECE 
so you can have you know interact with the lecturer and the, the students i think it, it helps you know yeah that's very true thank you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's just a question here about the difference between the Master of Education and Educational Practice. Um, so the main difference between those two programs is that the Master of Education is a research program and the Master of Education Practice is a taught program. So with the Master of Education, you will do two elective courses and then a research methods course, but you're kind of building into um, a 90 point thesis, which is a big independent piece of research. Um, you will be working with either one or two supervisors, but you won't be attending classes alongside other students. Uh, whereas in the Master of Education practice, you will go through a series of taught courses. So in every single semester that you study in, you will be in a course with other students, with a class, with a different lecturer. Um, so that's, that's sort of the main difference there. Okay, Hannah. And uh, Sophie, can I ask one question? Yes, because sir. master of in education and in education educational practice, that's also another different. One is you know taught, one is you know research based, right? After, if it's taught based, after that you can't go to PhD, right? Yeah. yeah. So I think yeah. everyone need to remember of this. If later you you are you are planning to go to PhD study, you need to think about this. Yeah. Yeah, yes, no, that's that's very true. Yeah. So for the research programs, if you're thinking, even if it's just a vague thought at this stage, yeah. um, I would be looking at a research program. Yeah, that's when I when I was, you know, uh, choosing and I think when I doing my application, I was thinking, you know, which one I should choose. So I can theory about, you know, research based because I, because at that moment, although I wasn't sure, but just, you know, just in case, you know, so open yeah. the door for your guys, for yourself. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this might be a question for Josh. Yes. Um, so if somebody has a bachelor's degree in economics and a master of law and a graduate diploma in teaching, could mm -hmm. they then apply for a PhD in education or a, um, yeah, it, I suppose either a PhD program or um, an EDD? Um, thank you. Yes, thanks for your question. Um, the answer is yes. Um, I know a colleague who did his bachelor in computer science, masters in business administration, and did his PhD in education. So we look at your qualifying program. And so what was your master's degree about? So you did it in law. Was your topic education related? If the answer is yes, then you can you know, easily use that for the PhD. Or it could be that you have publications related to education. You, know, you can add that to your master's and then you know, it can be suitable for the PhD program. And so that is why it is important to contact your potential supervisor where he can assess your thesis or make recommendations as to what you need to do to be able to get into the program. So yes, this shouldn't stop you from applying. Let's go ahead and, and apply. Thank you. Hannah, Josh, I mm. think, you know, uh, apart from you consider, considering about the qualification, another thing is for, my, for the PhD is about GPA, right? You know, we can apply, but if we can get in or not, it's another question, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> of course you can apply everyone can apply yeah. but i think i think it's jing chu i think her question is is you know of course she can apply anyone can apply but if you want apply you want to get in right yes <laughs> yeah i think uh, the uh, requirement of gpa is gpa is at least six right average is six right yes Average six, it means B plus. So your GPA has to be uh, average B plus. So if it's not B plus, is it is is there another way? Um, you know, there are exceptional cases where you know someone perhaps have a very strong research publication background, you know, and so for example. You know, they are mature students, they've published a lot, they have research experience, and 
perhaps their GPA is five point something. You know, this is an exceptional case where the supervisor can say, um, though this person doesn't meet the, you know, the GPA requirement, but I think you know, they are a strong fit for the PhD. So they can, you know, put a case in and the School of Graduate Studies can allow that. You know, so, um, yeah, so I think it shouldn't stop. So that's why I'm saying that, um, you know, the most important thing is to always ask. Nothing should stop you from yeah. you know, mm -hmm. pursuing your goal, especially with GQ question about you know your educational background. Mm -hmm. Personally, I also have a my bachelor was in political science, you know, but I've diverted and now I'm in education. So mm -hmm. it's all about the topic that you want to explore. It is really important. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for, I just want to make it clear to everyone, because Sophie said, if you, for example, if you're to, from bachelor to master, if your GPA is not five plus, and then that's a pathway to do, to do master degree, it's a mm -hmm. postgraduate degree. Di diploma certificate, right? So that's no bridge cost for PhD, Josh? No? So, sorry, come again. Um, I, okay. I, I, you know, for better, better to go to master, right? Mm -hmm. you know, they, uh, they have a requirement for GPA five, five or plus, right? Yes. Five plus, yeah. Mm -hmm. But someone, when they study, you know, better, they didn't even think about master. Oh, yeah. so the GPA maybe is only four or three mm. point five. Mm. Yeah. But Sophie said if your GPA is under five, the GPA is not is the can't reach the, the requirement. But they have a bridge course, kind of okay. like you know postgraduate yeah. diploma, cert, postgraduate certificate in mm. whatever. But yeah. that's a two papers. In mm. these two, your GPA has to be B, right, Sophie? Mm. Yes. and then you could do, can go to master so it's kind of like a bridge course and that yes. gives you a second chance for your gpa mm. so for the doctor is it a, you know, a second chance or bridge course or oh bridge? yes oh yes we have a bridging for those um for phd as well so for example someone may not have a strong research background yeah. And so what the supervisors will do is that, okay, they will admit them, but then ask them to enroll in research method course mm -hmm. as part of your provisional year goals. So usually when you start your PhD, you have about nine provisional year goals, but some will have about 10 or 11 because for, they don't have a strong research background. So the supervisor will say, okay, I'm going to admit you on the condition that you enroll in these research method courses. You know, so that's why I said in my presentation that there is no taught courses in the PhD. You just start straight away with your research. But if you don't have a strong research foundation or background, your supervisor is encouraged that you do a research method course. Luckily, you don't pay for that. Usually, you know, they just ask you to enroll it and it's free of charge, which is very helpful for people. Yeah. Oh, that's very good. Um, I suppose that that sort of ties into a question here about if somebody has done um, a taught master's program, yeah, and they apply for a PhD. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with a taught master's, um, as Sophie said in the presentation, um, you know, it, it's you know, if you are thinking about PhD, then you should think about doing something research related, not taught. Uh, yeah. But um, you know, again, that also shouldn't stop you. You know, as I just said, if your supervisor thinks that you don't have a strong research background because your research or your master's was purely taught, they can make recommendation that you will need to enroll in these courses to help you kind of um, you know, have that research foundation for the PhD. So um, as I said, you know, if you are thinking about PhD now and you haven't done your master's, then as Sophie said, go the research way. But if you've already done the thoughts and you can't go back to change that, it still shouldn't stop you. And another way is even right now, you can start publications, you know, which is also a good way to show that you have a strong research background. Yeah. Okay. Can you, can I ask a favor, George? Mm. Uh, 
is it possible, you know, for you to add one page on this PowerPoint to talk about the kind of like a bridge course, you know, for the PhD, if someone can't, can't meet the requirement of, of direct to go to PhD, for example, you said, you know, you have publications and then your supervisor said yes, and then, no, you know, your GPA maybe is fine, but your said your supervisor said, oh, you, you are capable to do PhD, that's good. And also another thing is you re enroll in research master or whatever. Is it possible to do that? Yes, um, you mean in the future or now? Uh, maybe later, because I'm yeah. thinking later, maybe someone will ask for, hey, can they have the PowerPoint or something? Mm -hmm. We can go through to have a look to, you know, so if you, if it's possible for, you know, after this, you know, you could, if you could add one page, you know, so when I send this PowerPoint to the group, so they can have ideas, they don't miss anything. Did you get me? Yes, I get it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. sorry for the interrupt. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, and yes, we will make this available for you to share. Um, yeah, after this. okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Um, so we have a question here about the Master of Secondary Teaching. Uh, unfortunately, that's no longer a program that we're offering. Um, yeah, I think it's been a couple of years since since we've offered that program. So. If you're graduating from a Bachelor of Teaching Early Childhood and you are thinking that you'd like, you know, another string to your bow, you may want to teach primary or secondary mm -hmm. in addition. Um, it's, it's easier to apply for the primary program. Secondary is a little bit trickier uh, because you do need teachable subjects. But for both of those programs, it would be a graduate diploma in teaching that you'd be looking at. Um, if you're wanting to teach secondary and you've done a bachelor of early childhood we would always be able to recommend some courses that you could do beforehand to give you those subjects to teach at secondary level as well mm. um, and also a question about finding out gpa there is a gpa calculator on the website um, i wouldn't necessarily recommend sort of you know agonizing over it if you are looking at it and you're trying to figure it out it can be quite difficult if your qualifications are international as well um so generally if you're thinking about your gpa because you're wanting to apply for a program don't worry too much about trying to figure it out yourself because it is something that our admissions department are highly skilled in and they they make those assessments very quickly whereas um yeah for for you and i it can be quite difficult to assess our own gpa mm -hmm. um we have a question here as well about master of professional studies leading to phd which i'm, I'm glad we have a question about that because yeah it is quite interesting it's uh, technically falls under a taught program but because it does have a 60 point dissertation it can lead to PhD study um, and the second question here is about needing is it two electives that you need or is it an elective and a research methods um, that's going to depend a little bit on your prior study because if you've done a research methods or research in the past um, you may not need to do a research methods course However, if you've just done a bachelor's degree in the past and you haven't done a research methods course, um, then you will likely need to do an elective course, a research methods course, and then your 60 point dissertation. Um, I would sometimes recommend as well, if it's been a little while since you've been in research, just to pick up that research methods course anyway, because it's very, very useful mm -hmm. to set you yeah. up for the dissertation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, did you want to add to that at all, Camille, or no? Um, no, really. I think she said only need one elective paper. I think need two, right? Definitely two, yeah. Uh, for Master of, Ed Master of Professional Master. Studies in Education, it would be, um, you could do one elective, one oh, research yeah, method, and, and then the yeah. dissertation, sorry. yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, and then we've just got, I'll just take this last question here, which is what career can we take when we finish the Master of Education practice? Many, many different ones. Um, it, it's going to depend to an extent on the courses that you take in it. 
Um, if you're thinking about working perhaps at a ministry level in policy, then there are courses that you could take as part of that program um, that will teach you about what it is like to work in, in a sort of wider, broader education setting and in policy. Um, if you are wanting to simply advance, you know, up the pay scale um, and in your career and add something to your practice, then that's that's also a great option for you. Um, yeah, and I don't know if you wanted to add to that, Camilla. Not really. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I think, you know, everyone's a difference. <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah but um I think for that program because it is a series of talk courses and there are so many talk courses available uh it sort of is what you make of it as well if that makes sense so depending on where you want to go in I would say yeah look at where you want to go in your career and then come and have a chat with us and we can always recommend um courses and pathways to try and get you there yeah mm -hmm. yeah so there was a question in the chat um, oh yes, thank you. It says that what what if my bachelor's GP does not reach five plus, but I have a master's degree and I apply for the master's in Auckland University? Ah uh, yes, definitely. Um, basically, whatever your highest level of study is, that's what we will take the GPE or GPA assessment on. Um, so if you haven't done so well in your bachelor's, but then you've done better in your master's degree, we will assess your GPA based on that. So yes, absolutely. Cool, I think we're, we're almost out of time, so we'll just move on. Um, now, if you, if you do want to follow us um, on any of our social medias, please do, because we share quite a lot of the latest sort of news and upcoming events there. Sophie, I think, I think on the chat group is still another question. Oh, uh, yep, yeah, sure. Do you mind have a look? Um, Okay, cool. So I've just got one question here about why doesn't Master of TESOL belong to your faculty? Mm -hmm. um, we do have uh, postgraduate programs that are called Teaching Linguistically Diverse Learners. So those are the programs that we would recommend if you're a current classroom teacher um, and you're wanting to look at teaching linguistically diverse learners. So either teaching English as a second language um, or teaching learners with linguistically diverse needs. Um, the Master of TESOL at the moment sits with arts uh, and that's it's just we and arts sort of share quite a lot of common interests. Um, we share some courses for some programs as well so it just at the moment is sitting under arts um, but we do also have a program that is more focused on education if you're interested in teaching TESOL. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Is it possible to leave someone's email address here so that if they have a problem, so they can just email to the person? Oh, yeah. Yes, good. definitely. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So my name is um, Sophie scott Elvidge and my role is Postgraduate Taught Recruitment Specialist. So if you're thinking about studying any of these programs, but you do want to just have a chat further about any of them, um, or if you want to have a chat about courses that you're doing if you're already in the program anything like that do feel free to reach out to the email address on the screen um, and I think we did get to all the questions tonight but if there were any in the chat that we didn't get to we'll have a look at those after this um, and get back to you as well but I just want to say thank you so much to Josh and Camille for your time as well and Shishia thank you to everyone in the audience for making the time to come tonight Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sophie and Joshua. Thank you for sharing this with us. Thank you for your time. And I need to say thank you to Gloria because she helped me as well. And thank you for everyone attending this. Yeah. And hopefully it, it you know it's helpful for everyone. Okay. Yeah. I think that's all for today. Lovely, yeah. thank you. Okay, thank have you. Have a everyone. good night, everyone. Okay, have a good night. Okay, Thanks. thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.